Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of WTF. We, we hope you enjoyed day one as much as we did. Um, and I am especially excited to be joined virtually today um, by Laureen Powell Jobs, uh, the founder of Emerson Collective and just a force in so many uh, social justice, ph philanthropic and other issues of our time. So uh, Laureen, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jessica. I'm happy to be here. Let's start with the election. Why not? You know, it's top of mind for everyone. Um, I know uh, at Emerson and you personally have been um, very involved. Tell us what you've been up to. Sure. Um, and you're right. We are very involved and we're working with a lot of, of voting rights organizations across the country. So this is how we think about it. We're in the middle of a pandemic and we want uh, as Americans, as many people as possible to vote in a presidential election. We'll take those two things as given. Um, and so, however, given, given the constraints of a pandemic, the safest and most responsible way to vote would be where you're not proximate to other people and not necessarily touching common surfaces, et cetera. And so, so vote by mail or absentee voting, which is the same thing where you actually fill out your ballot at home and you deliver it safely to either a mailbox or a drop box is the safest and most responsible way to vote. Um, in fact, it's predicted that 80 million people will want to vote in this manner this year, which is about twice the number that have voted um, in that manner in 2016. So we should just take this all for granted. I mean, it's, it's really not that complicated. So we would assume that this should be supported congressionally and by the White House in every way possible. But in fact, that's not what we're seeing. We actually have seen the Trump administration do everything it can right now to deny access to voting, including bringing over 40 lawsuits against states with the intent to actually make voting more complicated and harder, especially for specific groups of people, minority voters and young voters. And furthermore, the president has said directly that the greatest risk to his reelection is that they don't win their lawsuits. Uh, that he said it puts the election at risk if we don't win. Um, so, so we are looking at this in a very logical way. We're kind of mapping the life cycle of a voter from voter registrations to access to vote by mail or drop boxes or to voting in person on November 3rd and trying to find all of the, the pain points along the way. But if we look at the supports to the US Postal Service, quite the opposite has happened. And, and anyone following this knows that uh, Louis DeJoy was put in as the Postmaster General. He has had no experience. He did a big reorganization a couple of months before an election when we expect unprecedented numbers of vote by mail. And they have constrained post, post office hours. They got rid of sorting and letter collection boxes. So it's the opposite direction. The other option is for people to take their ballots and bring them to drop boxes. Now, drop boxes have been used for decades. These are state-run, county-approved drop boxes that allow for people to drop off their ballot. Um, there are state after state after state that have now contested the use of drop boxes. So, for example, um, the state of Pennsylvania now has sued to remove all drop boxes. The state of Iowa has said drop boxes can only be used inside county offices. So you actually have to go in and, and find the drop box that's inside that actually um, defeats the purpose of a drop box. Uh, New Hampshire is requiring that if you fill out your ballot at home, you have to go and hand it directly, personally, to an election official. Again, it renders a Dropbox moot. 
So, so all of this we're seeing is, is a deliberate effort to disenfranchise some voters and to make voting less, not more accessible. If we look at voting in person, um, we can look at the examples of the primaries in Georgia and Wisconsin and see what happened. There was less, less access to voting places. There were broken voting machines. There were lines where people were waiting hours and hours. And in an assessment done in Georgia, it was found that um, in, in majority African-American communities in Georgia, the wait time was 51 minutes to vote. And in the majority white neighborhoods in Georgia, the wait time was six minutes. So, and, and that was just one primary and, uh, and one example of the kind of disenfranchisement that's happening. So there are people that we're working with like Mark Elias at Democracy Docket, organizations like Voto Latino, Si Se Puede, sorry about that, um, When We All Vote, um, where we're, we're coalescing these tables so that people can understand what are some of the actions that, that can be taken. We also at Emerson have stood up an organization called We The Action, uh, which uh, asks lawyers to volunteer on the platform um, and it matches generally projects that need pro bono legal help with lawyers who have extra time. But around the election, all of these lawyers and we have thousands of lawyers that are on the platform now, uh, they, will, they are devoted to doing election law work across all key states. Um, and it's something that, in fact, if people are, are watching this, if they could spread the word about with the action to any, um, any of their lawyers or any friends who are lawyers to sign up is something that directly can be um, helpful, I think, and very useful in an election that as many people say, it's one of the most consequential, if not the most consequential elections of our lifetime, um, where the, the right to vote is being challenged across the board. Mm -hmm. oh, they, I mean, that's an incredible amount of effort and, and some very interesting um, initiatives. How, how are you feeling about it? I know that you, are you feeling optimistic? Are you feeling concerned? I mean, you're- I'm, re I'm very concerned. I think um, any time that in a democracy, the, 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 the party that's in power is trying to make it very difficult for people's voice to be heard, for their vote to count, everyone should be concerned. So I'm really concerned. I mean, if we look at 2016, at the malfeasance from Russia, really there hasn't been a direct um, consequence or or even an acknowledgement of the kind of foreign intervention in our elections to prevent that from happening. I'm not even talking about external forces. I'm talking about internally, domestically, we are sabotaging the ability of our fellow citizens to vote. That's enormously concerning. And I think I think all of us, as we pay more and more attention to the election and what's going on, will feel equally alarmed. So I'm concerned. Uh, I think, uh, listen, we, we work in the social sector at Emerson Collective and it would be wonderful for us uh, to work at, at both the municipal, state and federal level if we had, if we had partners that we could work with at the federal level around immigration reform, around climate, around education, around sensible gun laws. Um, it would be wonderful, um, of course. So, so that is, that's my bias. I would actually really like to have a federal partner uh, that represents the supermajority of Americans who are aligned with the, the kind of 
work that that we're doing um, right now we do not have that mm -hmm. this seems a silly question but have you endorsed endorsed biden for president or are you are you operating at that level or you're focusing on the issues primarily yeah i i, I would <laughs> i'm i'm hereby endorsing <laughs> there, <Joe> Biden. <laughs> there you go um i, I don't think i don't think endorsements um, from individuals necessarily move anyone's uh, conscience or, or sense of morality. I think each one of us understands what's at stake. And um, even though there's, there's quite a um, stratification of news and um, we may have different perspectives on um, on the type of leadership that it is currently the Trump administration versus an incoming administration. Uh, I think that most Americans really desire very similar things. Um, and, and it's kind of core to our American values. And uh, one of those core values is that our vote is our voice. And by restricting the vote, we are restricting the voice. Yeah. You mentioned among these issues, education. I mean, this is a tumultuous time, if, if we can say that, maybe a traumatic time. Um, I think traumatic, field. more like it. Um, and, you know, you've been on the leading edge of ed reform for um, a long time now. What are you seeing? What are you thinking about? What are some of the issues that need urgent attention? Well, it's, it's a good question. I, mean, I think that... Um, everyone would love for children to return to school safely and safe for children, families, and teachers. Uh, that's universal. Uh, and I think that um, the last six months actually gave us some time and a window to, to try to figure out how, how could we do this safely. And there, there, are, there are other entities that took this seriously, like grocery stores stayed open, um, airports stayed open, and they figured out how do we do this safely with, with good testing, with good PPE, with good ventilation, et cetera. Um, we didn't see that level of coordination around schools. And, and the summer weeks kept coming and coming, and that work actually didn't happen. But um, the work that you're referencing of ours started obviously way before the pandemic. So we're very focused on educational equity. So I will, I will tell you before the pandemic even, um, we, look at, we look at student outcome data for generally for high school students because the majority of our work is done in high schools. So the last NAEP test, which is the national assessment of educational progress, um, which was done several years ago, showed that in the United States, stay with me, 48% of black students and 37% of Latinx students graduated high school performing at below basic levels in reading. And so it's basically, Half, half of all black students are, were performing below basic in reading. In math, it's over 60% below basic. And for Latinx students, it's over half below basic in mathematics at the end of high school. So that's at the end of their tenure in public education. Mm -hmm. um, furthermore, for for African-American and Latinx students who remain in high school at the end of 12th grade, they perform at about the same level as white students at the end of eighth grade. Wow. So, so that is the gap. Yeah. It's your entire high school years. Mm. That's the gap. That's, that is, that is the data in the United States of America pre-pandemic. And we have, we have no testing data. We have very spotty data. 
uh, over the last six months about who actually engaged online and and what the and what the learning outcomes are. But we, what we can say, and I think everybody who has a kid knows this, it's not better. It's worse. <laughs> it's worse. Uh, we know this. I think the learning loss, once we know it, if we measure it, is going to be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We, we actually need all of our creativity. We need all of our will. We, act, we need to engage community. We need to engage students, families, and teachers. So, so in a virtual learning environment or a hybrid learning environment, there are a lot of ways to enhance the learning experience. Um, certainly, daily check-ins, lots of peer-to-peer -peer teaching and learning, um, breakout rooms, set, having, having the kind of supplies for experiments that can be hand-on for, for students in their own homes having learning pods, which is happening with a lot of schools, but making sure that that's facilitated so that students aren't left behind. Um, there are lots and lots of techniques that can be used around competency-based education and project-based learning uh, that, that can now really lean on the agency of individual students. Uh, some of this is happening in bright spots or beginning to happen, but I'd say the vast majority of high schools are not even close to where they need to be. I mean, as I hear you discuss this, that equity theme is very front and center, right? How it just seems like the risk of those gaps widening when there are some tools and techniques, but they require resources, they require time, they require Focus. attention they require you know um well they, they require know. real deliberate focus and attention and communication um it doesn't you know in high school uh you it helps to have a supportive family structure but you actually you can have other structures that support if if families structure are not as supportive as, as they could be in in you're in home learning. So there are, you know, the great thing about virtual learning is, is one to many is very possible. So it's very possible to lift up the most brilliant educators on the planet and, and have a, you know, a democratization of access to the, to the greatest educators. That's the promise of virtual learning. And then having, having supports underneath that, both from the, from the teachers and the students and the parents if they're available, that all, that all helps. There are other ways too, something that we're really committed to at XQ, which is using community members who wish to opt in and be helpful and really accessing the inherent talents that reside in every single community. And, and engaging in that way. And honestly, Jessica, I think people are hungry for that level of engagement. I mean, I know I, know I am. You know, it's I volunteered really to do hard. online. I was like, yeah. Yes, and there, there are new companies that are starting up um, that allow for this kind of peer-to-peer -peer support. So there's, there's a company that uh, we just were looking at called Fiveable, which allows it's it's AP support, and um, they've they reached uh, last year a million students who have taken the AP, supporting and tutoring the students who who are on track to take the AP. Stuff like this can accelerate really quickly uh, around at the high school level, and then in the middle and elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that everyone should check those out because I, I think we. Um, and, and we should need to also test and also going back to what you're saying, like if we can't even get our handle to some degree on, on, on that kind of discrepancy um, or what, what we're up against. But we really, so I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we need to know, um, but there are also, so those are the, the high stakes national testing, which, which shows nationwide what the inequities are and, and where we need to, 
to focus and, and bring energy and resources, but there are other ways. There are really good ed tech companies that are now establishing within a lesson plan this micro testing and micro assessment that happens along the way so that teachers can see in real time whether a concept is is being grasped or not, which is really important because the national tests are a lagged test. You know, the students have graduated. By the time everyone gets a sense to analyze and look at it, the, that whole, the students are done with their educational experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, also some in terms of people wanting to participate, we're all feeling it in some way. Anyone who's a parent is feeling it. So hopefully, yeah. I, I, I'm hopeful that it will engage people in, in this. I'm way. hoping it will too. I think that um, for the first time, this is really fascinating, for the first time globally in uh, April, every single student of school age was out of school. That meant every single parent on the globe was, was a teacher, which is pretty remarkable. And so I think everyone has a renewed appreciation for the work that goes into teaching and, and how to perhaps a little more curiosity around how the brain learns and how to deliver teaching instruction and and at what level of engagement is required. And I don't think, no one thinks that virtual learning is a good replacement for in-person learning. Um, but using virtual resources uh, to, as a scaffold and, and as foundational support could be enormously helpful. Uh, I know Khan Academy, for example, has their, their usage has gone through the roof and they have really delivered, they, they manage to meet students where they are, they bring in really good assessment and they do a gap analysis so that they can understand um, if someone actually isn't grasping a concept, say in, in algebra, they map it down to understanding, well, it's actually dividing and multiplying fractions. That's what was never grasped. So that's what we have to go deep on. Lorraine, I, I wanted to ask you about the media business. A little while back, you became the majority owner of The Atlantic, which is mm -hmm. doing a phenomenal job during the pandemic and always. And um, I don't know, probably a dozen plus so other investments or um, partnerships. Um, tell us a bit first, why the media business? Why invest and partner up with, with those companies? Um, well, as you know, it's really hard to find a, a vibrant business model for for-profit media. So our involvement in media is not to turn a profit. It's actually an honor for, for me and my team to be associated with some of the greatest journalists in the country and in the world. Uh, and I think it's essential to, to, in this time especially, to help shore up the business model and bring in patient capital while that transition is happening so that these, the outlets that I think are publishing really important, truly excellent journalism can keep doing their journalism as the transition is figured out. Uh, so we got into the media business more or less because it became an opportunity for us. We didn't actually seek it out, uh, but we are, we are very attuned to telling stories and following narratives and, and trying to be deeply helpful in both a, a cultural and a social way. And so the role that journalism plays in, in supporting and advancing the culture is essential, uh, mm -hmm. especially excellent high quality journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that, that was the attraction to us. Um, I think that it's important that everyone know that great journalism should not come for free. Uh, this, is, this is a civic good this should be supported by everyone who consumes it. Um, 
willingly and generously. So, so I think you know, we're involved both from a for-profit model and a nonprofit model. And um, I think for local journalism, uh, has, which has complete, you know, it, which, which as a model has completely imploded, the nonprofit structure seems to be the most sustainable and, and the one that should be embraced because uh, you know better than I, but I think in the last 15 years, we've lost over 2000 local newspapers across the country. And, and those that are still uh, operating are existing on a much thinner budget and a much smaller staff. And, um, and that, that is not healthy for a vibrant democracy. Uh, but there are amazing nonprofit organi journalist organizations uh, that we're happy to support. The American Journalism Project started with the, with the distinct um, uh, goal to shore up local journalism in a nonprofit sector. So we're happy to be part of that. They just announced um, their first 12 newsrooms that they're supporting with funding and, and organizational capacity. Of course, ProPublica and the Marshall Project and Lawfare and the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. They, they do amazing work lifting up stories um, and telling them in a deep and comprehensible way for, for all of us to consume. And then the for-profit model, you know, we're just, we're looking at the hybrid of, of revenue sources between subscriptions and ad revenue because event revenue is uh, unlike your virtual event. I mean, other than that, there it's are no quite different. Yeah, there are no events this year, and and probably not next year. So that's not a revenue stream that one can rely on. Mm -hmm. When it one of uh, a favorite parlor game among my friends is to guess about whether you may own the New York Times someday. So I don't know if you, um, but have that I, opportunity I, has not <laughs> crossed my my path at all. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, um, I think I, I think I think the the family is so so strong and so committed. I mean, really, they have done uh, a great service to our country by supporting that that great newspaper. Yeah, but I think I, I say it because I think even the question just shows the impact you're having on our industry already, and, and a lot of people are. Are very grateful for it. So, um, well, I'm also a happy consumer. You know, yeah. I, I'm a happy consumer of the information and of Axios and the Atlantic. Uh, so, I want to make sure that these are very healthy, vibrant uh, organizations. Yeah. So I, I ticked off these big meaty issues, but but what else? I mean, you, Emerson is involved in so many things. I'm curious what. What else is occupying your time, areas that you are thinking about that you may want to explore more in the future? Um, well, we, we are, we're in the mix. You know, our, our country's going through a lot of pain and struggle and change. And because we're in the country and so we're feeling it too. Uh, this is a really difficult time. And, um, the digging in around issues of racial justice and try and and listening and thinking through what is the right path forward how do we actually build uh, a much better more inclusive honorable country is something that gives me um, a lot of energy and also i i'm hopeful that in this moment through so much struggle and through so much pain, we actually will come out better and more compassionate and more empathetic. Um, I really believe that that's possible and it's, it's up to us to make that determination whether that's, that's how we end up behaving. Mm -hmm. you know, there are great lessons to be learned this year. Uh, mm -hmm. And I love how people are deeply engaging in this way. Yeah. 
Um, and before we wrap up, I mean, I, I, tell us something about yourself people don't know. I know that's a strange question, but I feel like there's, there's so much, you do so much, you're passionate about so many things and um, you like to put your, your causes out there and not always you, but I guess you're, in, you're very related. <laughs> but I'm just curious, I'd love you know, the people in the room to know something about you that you wish more people knew. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, even just the notion of that question um, kind of <laughs> kind of makes me nervous because I don't know that I wish people to know anything about me. Um, I, I, you know, I work a lot and I'm very devoted to my kids and I am grateful for both of them. Um, I am, I'm, I'm also fun loving and I love a good dance party. That is true. Uh, when I when I was working in New York City in the early part of my career, yeah, I just I love to to just get my exercise by going out dancing. So that's something that I miss a lot. Although I have I have signed into DJ D Nice's virtual dance parties. Wow. Okay. Pretty much all the time. Um, yep. I follow whoever's whoever's spinning on Instagram. Uh, I, I really, I love hooking up into that. Um, I also am the one to always make the playlist for any dinner party that's here or any of my kids' birthday parties. So everybody relies on me for, for music. So I think um, probably one of the first things that I will do at the end of the pandemic when it's safe <laughs> to, to be next to people is go listen to live party. music. I have to, I love live music so much. It really feeds my soul and I miss it a lot. Yeah. Well, Lorreen, thank you. Your, your passion for these issues, I think even in a Zoom screen can, can really come across. I think, I know I find energizing and I hope many people here do as well. And I hope that everyone follows um, these causes and these issues and, uh, you know, thank you for being here to, to share all the work you're doing. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. At Intuit, we believe you cannot have prosperity without equality. Women and people of color should not be paid less than men for the same work. Three years ago, we made a commitment to reach and maintain pay equity for our employees. But pay equity is an ongoing process and all companies must join this fight. Like the 19th Amendment, we are not done.